from Linux uh, Foundation. She's going to be doing a session here on the OPNFV, the foundation for virtualized networking across multiple end-to-end -end open networking stacks. Thank you. So much. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. It's always the fun slot to be like last of the day. Everyone's tired. And between you and the last coffee break, certainly between you and the reception. So, um, so you know, I'll, I'll try to keep my, my content engaging for that. So, um, so I am Heather Kirksey. Um, I have been at the Linux Foundation for almost three years now. Um, I am the executive director of OPNFV um, and was brought in to head up the uh, OPNFV organization. Before that, I had uh, spent a large chunk of my career at Alcatel Lucent, so I've spent most of my um, tech career in telecom. And it's funny, I'd actually decided I didn't want to be in telecom anymore. Like, nothing had changed. It was the same old conversations. It was all boring. I wanted to do open source. I went to MongoDB. I wanted to be part of something new. And then I started seeing all these little things about NFV, SDN, cloud telecom transformation. And then I found out that the service providers were interested in open source of all the surprising things. And then I said, okay, I want to go back to telecom and I want to be part of this transformation. So it's been a very extraordinary journey. Um, you know, on the topic of open source, you know, not just in telecom, but all across multiple industries, you know, open source uh, development is accelerating. Um, worldwide, there are 20, more than 23 million open source developers more than 64 million repositories, and that's just on GitHub. That doesn't count perhaps private repositories for different foundations that they host themselves. Um, 41 billion lines of code. And what's extraordinary if you think about that is think how much effort it takes to generate 41 billion lines of code, right? No one company can do that on its own. And the really you know, important thing to keep in mind about open source is people tend to think of it as a license or they think of it as a business model or they think of it as getting something for free, what it really is is a way of working together across companies to produce your baseline uh, infrastructure so that various people can innovate on top of that. Um, using the example of Linux, think what it would be, what it would be like if everybody had to write their own operating system when they wanted to write an application, right? We would never have any applications. We would never have any innovation. So the reason that open source is so fundamentally powerful is that it enables people to work together to create more common code, right? Developers are a very sc scarce and precious resource, and to actually get things into the market quickly and have them be common for everybody so that the innovative, cool, new, fancy things on top um, can be done more easily, more quickly, and you can put your value there as a company. So thinking about uh, open source and telecom transformation, I mean, we've been hearing about this through various presentations all day, but you know, most of our history, most of our industry has been you know, very proprietary, very monolithically uh, integrated solutions. You know, you couldn't even integrate an EMS with someone else's appliance. You know, everything was bundled together. So you had layers and layers of customized stuff that ended up flooding your OSS, BSS, getting to a point where service providers found it very difficult to roll out new services. So, you know, thinking back a little ways, when SDN started coming onto the scene, right, and we started thinking about, let's separate and disaggregate the data plane from the control plane. Let's start to disaggregate software intelligence from hardware intelligence. Um, let's, let's start thinking about modularizing all the pieces of the network. And so we started this journey you know, Open Daylight was the very first networking project that came into the Linux Foundation, and that really sort of set the, the Linux Foundation on its journey uh, around networking and, and telecom. You know, sort of looking at that from, from then till now, to about 2016, you know, kind of through this year, we had a lot of other projects coming in addressing various parts of the networking stack, and I'll get to a stack diagram here in a minute. So we had a lot of projects launching, right? a lot of people found perhaps a bit confusing, um, but they basically were sort of, once you've disaggregated things, there, you, know, you need to have projects looking at all those different components. And now is where I think we're beginning to move into things like being production, going into actual networks. Now the key is to bring those things back together so that you actually have deployable solutions. 
so looking ahead, um, you know, I think we all know this. I just referenced referenced it right now. You know, tooling is very fragmented and disjointed in the you know in the back office. You know, heading into five G, you know, wanting to do all these cool new applications, especially on IoT, AR, VR. You know, automating sort of the back office, automating the care of your infrastructure, automating the deployment of services. They're scaling out. They're scaling in. That's going to be necessary before we kind of go to the next level. So, sort of the set of um, you know, projects that we've got in the LF. Um, this is a slide from a recent roadshow that ONAP, Open Daylight, and OPNFB did together. Is sort of across all of these projects, we're really looking at how we bring that automation, that control, that ease of use to the networks. So, kind of looking at sort of the you know the the stack. You know, the disaggregated hardware and software. Oops. I'm always never sure how to, don't know if this has a, I don't think it has a laser pointer. Um, so, you know, kind of going down all the way to kind of the bottom of the stack where you've got the hardware, um, not on the slide, but, you know, you've got groups like the Open Compute Project and the Telecom Infra Project doing um, hardware as open source projects. You know, then going on to the data plane where there are projects uh, like uh, DPDK, focused on acceleration. We heard uh, from Intel about that a little earlier. Then you've got FIDO and OBS um, as new uh, switching and forwarding um, planes. Then going into the software-defined networking piece with um, things like our SDN controllers. You, you heard from Timon from OnLab this morning. They have the Onos controller. Open Daylight is a controller in the Linux Foundation. So there are a lot of open source controllers out there. Um, then going into ONAP. Um, which you know, uh, is the sort of the end-to-end -end orchestration. So that's looking at the, the MANO piece of the transform network. And then Panda, which is another uh, fairly new project in the Linux Foundation, which is focused on um, big data analytics um, and integrating into kind of cool new machine learning um, and being able to bring in a lot of data from a lot of feeds and then put that into um, a big data platform with different types of telecom oriented applications uh, on top. And then OPNFE, which is what I'm about to start talking about, is a project that really looks at bringing all of those pieces together, right? It's great that we now have projects that are focused on what they're really good at and are writing these pieces of this disaggregated stack, but someone needs to kind of look at what it looks like to integrate them back together, test them end to end, and look at deploying them onto different infrastructures. And that's what OPNFE is all about. So we are basically systems integration as an open source project, which is a little bit rare. I don't think I know of very many other open source projects who decided to attack systems integration as their problem space. But uh, when we started, our service provide we had a lot of service providers uh, who really started us. And they had been in the Etsy NFE working group kind of realized that they wanted to go in open source direction. And they realized there are a lot of pieces out there already or pieces that they knew might be in the pipeline, but getting them to work with each other was hard. There were features that were missing. There were features that had multi-project dependencies and there was no way to test all of these things. So they really started with this idea that if we just have an organization focused on that aspect, we can probably get to NFP faster. Right? We don't want to start over and try to rewrite something like OpenStack or rewrite something like Open Daylight. That would be foolish. So the, the focus was to look upstream, take code upstream, uh, make sure that we have the capabilities there, and then make sure it works. So kind of high-level overview, you know, basically there are, you know, there's the infrastructure. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, there there, you know, there are still OEMs out there. You know, we've got great ODM partners like uh, uh, Q QDC here today. Um, you know, different hardware architectures out there, x86 and ARM. Um, so there's that that hardware infrastructure component. You know, your compute storage network, the virtualization of all of those. Then on top, your virtual functions and and your MANO. So with that sort of stack, we kind of organized ourselves in OPNFV across a number of different areas. One being integration, one being testing, one being the shepherding, the gap analysis and shepherding of features upstream, um, one being really looking at CI/CD, and I'm going to talk about that a bit in a moment, 
um, documentation and, and security. So our mantra within uh, OPNFV is create, compose, deploy, test, and iterate. So um, on the create piece, uh, that is what I'm talking about with the new feature development. So a great example of this is a project that we call Doctor, um, where um, some service providers and some vendors uh, looked at deploying OpenStack um, and looked at deploying it in some telecom scenarios and realized that the time it took to, def to detect faults and to remediate faults was on the order of 10 seconds, which if you're in a kind of basic failover scenario on something like an EPC, means your phone call's going to drop before you even realize that there's a problem with your network. And it's not gonna be one person's phone call that drops, it's gonna be hundreds of people whose phone call drops and they're going to be calling your call center then. So we had a group that looked at this, kind of realized that to make this happen, um, to, to get down to the right sort of time for fault detection, that there were about 10 different changes that were needed across multiple OpenStack projects. Some things in Neutron API, some things in Nova API, some things in AODH, some things in Solometer. And sort of over the course of three OpenStack releases, they were able to sort of patiently, bit by bit, uh, get those features in. And then at the uh, OpenStack Barcelona meeting several, I think that was about a year ago, we actually had a live code demo on stage where they set up a live private mobile network and started cutting cables in the back of the EPC and showed that the call stayed up. So we actually sort of you know, demonstrated that we really had gotten OpenStack to a mature enough point that it really does work for the operator use cases. Um, Compose refers to the integration that we do. Uh, deploy, we deploy onto various infrastructures. Um, I will talk in a minute in a minute about our Ferris test labs. Um, and then we test end to end. So this is another thing that's uh, really important is that a lot of these features depend on different pieces working together. So if you think about service function chaining, that requires you know, um, TACR, uh, OpenStack infra infrastructure, your SDN controller like Open Daylight, um, all to work in concert together. And so when we test a feature like service function chaining, we actually sort of put out the full stack and actually test service function chaining end to end and validate that you can instantiate a service chain and it works. You can you know, change the service chain and validate that, that it actually follows the configuration. And no one project is really able to do that level of integrated testing themselves. So we work really closely with our upstream partners to give them feedback. And then rinse, wash, repeat. Keep going on and on until we've, you know, gotten more pieces of the stack, we've gotten more of the features that the operators need. So I mentioned the sort of the getting feedback to the upstream communities. Um, one of the cool things that we've been working on recently is you know, thinking about DevOps, thinking about wanting to get fast feedback loops in cross multiple upstream open source communities. Um, one of the things that we have done recently is our cross community CI initiative. So we have integrated the CI-CD pipelines of OpenStack, OpenDaylight, and FIDO. Uh, OMAP is on deck for when they get their first release out. Um, so we actually are getting multiple deliveries from OpenStack a day. We're getting multiple deliveries from uh, FIDO and ODL a day. And we're actually integrating those and deploying those and doing tests on those on a daily basis and actually sending that feedback to them immediately. So instead of waiting for a stable release, doing six months of integration work, finding the bugs, filing those, waiting for the next release to actually implement bug features or, you know, bug fixes, sorry, or, you know, that the, validate that the features work, we're able to do that in hours, days. Um, and uh, it's really cool, actually, OpenStack has given our, C, our CI pipeline some uh, voting rights within their automated system. So if we can show that you know, changes to OpenStack actually break OPNFV, um, it will actually cause a patch to get rejected um, automatically. So um, this is a really cool way that we're seeing both the collaborative aspect of OpenStack and not just within a single community, but across communities, but also ensuring that the code that comes out of all of these is better, more resilient, more robust, um, and less buggy um, earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, so where do we deploy the software? I keep talking a 
about you know sort of we integrate things and we'll deploy it. We have a great program called the Pharos Test Lab Program, uh, which is a set of federated community labs. One of which is hosted by the Linux Foundation for OPNFB, but all the rest of them are actually hosted by our member companies and sometimes even companies who um, are not um, yet members. So this is you know a partnership that we've been discussing with Q. QTC to actually get them uh, up and running as a Ferris lab. So we have basically, the great thing about it is it first of all gives us a much larger pool of hardware to do testing on during our release. It also means that we test across hardware, right? So um, let's say whatever OEM, you know, Huawei is using, they've got that in their lab. Whatever vendors Orange is using, they've got a set of all their different vendors in, in their lab. Um, Intel has Intel White Box in their lab. So we're able to actually validate that you know, these builds actually work across different hardware. And that seems as though perhaps it should be somewhat non-trivial, except that um, in our first release, Arno fully one month of the delay in getting our first release out was just in basic different hardware configuration expectations across just two vendors. Um, you know, how do you set up, you know, OpenStack has six different uh, private networks that you need to set up. How do you set those up? The expectations were very, very, very different. Um, so one of the things we've been doing is coming up with consistent hardware definition files, pod description files, scenario description files. So this has done a lot to sort of improve the uh, interoperability for, um, for NFP software. The other thing I did is I mentioned that we do a lot of end-to-end -end testing. Um, we have a number of test projects, um, and this is sort of a, a snapshot from our Danube uh, release. Um, so we have functional testing, which is sort of what I was talking about before, where we figure out does service function tuning actually work? Does IPv6 actually work? Um, and then we have Yardstick, uh, which is generates various sort of KPIs for your infrastructure, and it is based on some Etsy specifications. Um, we have yardsticks, yard, sorry, we have bottlenecks and QTEP, um, one of which is around NFDI performance characteristic, characteristics, the other being around uh, benchmarking, trying to develop a benchmarking as a service tooling. And then um, finally, oh, and then we have StorePerf, which is a project looking at characterization characterizing virtual switch performance um, and working actually with the IETF to come up with what the right characterization um, metrics are for virtual switches. So um, we've got a lot of focus. You notice we have both functional testing and things that are looking at benchmark and performance testing. Um, and we've got even more of that in our, in our Euphrates release, which I'm about to talk about. But you know, what that means is if you're, as we're really looking forward to deploying sort of real infrastructures out there, they don't just need to be functionally conformant, they actually need to be performant from a, you know, throughput and bandwidth perspective as well. So one of the things we're looking to do is create common tooling out there available to the entire industry that they can use within their labs to benchmark their own, their own products, that service providers can use to benchmark and test and look at the performance and tune the performance of different commercial offerings that they're looking at deploying um, and really sort of get the belief out there that the stuff works and it performs enough to put it in your actual network. So looking at our um, release history, um, our very first release was Arno, um, it was June 4th, and that one was really basically, can we integrate OpenStack, Open Daylight, and deploy it on a couple different vendor servers. Sounds really basic, but it was actually really hard at that time. Um, at that point, no one did that in an automated fashion. It was very highly tuned, very manual. And one of the things that we did do from the beginning was insist that if it's going to go out in a release from OPNFB, it's going to be automated deployment. It's going to be automated testing. It's going to be automated integration because we believe that that's you know, how we're going to move forward with the right agility um, as an industry. Moving into Brahmaputra, we actually started to bring in a number of different communities and actually showed that we could replicate that with, for example, um, supporting multiple different um, SDN controllers by supporting 
even more, all, you know, a full set of Pharaoh's test labs, not just two. Um, you know, really sort of started to scale our process and infrastructure. In our Colorado release, we actually began to see the fruit um, fruition of some of those features that we've been pushing upstream. Like I mentioned, fault remediation and detection. Um, a lot of IPv6 work started to come out there. That was when we first started seeing function chaining, layer two, layer three VPN support. You know, these are really just foundational things that you need to do in NFV, but which had been lacking. And then in Danube um, was when we really, I think, could start to put point to having integrated a full stack of all the different pieces out there necessary for um, an NFVI, as well as our initial integration with Nano with the OpenO project. So Euphrates actually uh, went live on Tuesday morning, so it's still live news, so it's very exciting. Um, our community, I think, is still catching up on their sleep. And um, sort of in Euphrates, we've really started the journey towards uh, cloud native. So, you know, really begin, we've been talking about containers for a while, we've been talking about um, Kubernetes for a while, but it had been a lot of hand waving. Um, and in this release, uh, we've really started making strides on now supporting those new cloud native um, architectures. You know, we heard a lot about edge earlier. Um, a lot of folks are really thinking edge architectures are going to demand microservices. And so, uh, you know, we've started making strides there. We've got um, Kubernetes integration. At the same time, our upstream projects, uh, FIDO and Open Daylight, had also done work themselves uh, to uh, integrate better with Kubernetes. And so we're able to sort of take advantage of what our upstream communities had done. Um, I mentioned our XCI initiative earlier. The work to support that's been going on for, I want to say, about two years. And in this release, we actually started um, using it in our, in our release. Um, it wasn't kind of just a, a proof of concept. So we actually started using it in a release, which kind of think this combination of DevOps and you know, cloud native architecture support really is this kind of you know, modern data center software management techniques uh, becoming real. Um, we've integrated some um, if you, heard, if you were here for the um, Intel pre presentation from Rajesh earlier, he was talking about service assurance and being able to get visibility into telemetry. So we have a barometer project in OPNFV that's been focusing on that um, and you know, so that we can send it to something like ONAP. We also integrated with a project called Calypso, um, which does um, network uh, visibility and allows you kind of to see your network nodes and, and inventory and everything. It's a, it's a kind of cool visualization front end tool. Um, we also made some strides in, in security, supporting eVPN, um, you know, getting the service function chaining more robust and resilient. Um, and then um, one of the cool things is, you know, I mentioned tools, uh, our performance testing earlier, we had two new projects on the performance testing side that delivered into this release. One is called Sample VNF, which aims to actually mimic real world style workloads on your infrastructure, right? So if you think about the demands that a use case like a virtual CPE puts on your uh, infrastructure, right? Like tons of fairly small instances um, with, you know, sort of going to various uh, subscriber management versus something like large scale, you know, core routing and core forwarding, right? Those, those put different types of demands on your NFVI. So the goal with Sample VNF is to really look at mimicking world, real world workloads and allowing you to sort of tune and uh, test the performance of your NFVI based on those. Um, NFV, NFV Bench is another um, end to end bench uh, marking framework, really looking at the data plane and bandwidth and throughput and the basic internet stuff. And then we also kind of did a lot of improvement on a lot of other, a lot of our other testing projects. Just a couple of things by the numbers. I, I always love this. Um, you know, this goes back to the importance of automation. Um, you know, in the course of our time frame of deploying uh, Euphrates, we uh, deployed OpenStack more than eight thousand times. Most of those on full HA bare metal. So. Um, you know, when we first started, it might take us a couple days to get an OpenStack deploy to actually deploy. 
Um, and now we run through this 8,000 times in you know, just a couple month period. Um, we had uh, more than 3,000 uh, open daylight deployments. So you know, we're really getting to that point where we can um, reliably and comfortably deploy uh, these open source software components out there. Um, and you know, we've got our various upstream deployments. Uh, one other cool thing is we had four interns uh, who were committers during the process of Euphrates. Right, how many interns have we had overall? Yeah, so we will have had 15 uh, interns in OPNFB by the end of the year. And this is something about which I'm quite passionate because our industry is too old. Um, and to, to really realize, you know, I think innovation and passion going, going forward, we need to excite the next generation of minds to want to work in networking and to not just want to go to the web scale companies and not just think that Google is their only interesting employment opportunity. So I'm really excited to see that we've got a lot of interest in the interns and we're getting a lot of participation from, um, from university students in what we're doing. And so this is the actual sort of stack that we ended up having um, in uh, Euphrates. So um, you know, kind of down at the bottom, I, I mentioned our Ferris labs. Um, and another cool thing to note is that we also have some labs that have got OCP hardware in them. So we do have that marriage of uh, open source software and hardware. Um, and then we've got uh, DPDK going out there and some ODP out there in our ARM lab. Um, FIDO and OVS at the, the next layer. Um, on our network control, we added yet another choice because apparently people want so much choice in their options for uh, software-defined network control, but uh, we've got Open Daylight, Onos, Open Contrail, and uh, OVN. Uh, supporting, obviously, KVM and then uh, LXD containers. Um, also, in our testing projects, um, we can deploy a lot of our test tools within Docker as well. Self storage then at the um, you know, cloud orchestration level, uh, OpenStack and Kubernetes for the first time. And then um, we did have an integration with um, OpenBaton, which is a nano framework out of the Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin. Um, everyone always asks the question, where is ONAP? Um, ONAP is in the last stages of their first release. and I did not want to distract them from that because putting out your first release as a community is a huge deal. Um, and you really need to focus on building community and process. So you've been hearing a lot today about edge computing. You heard about core this morning. If you're in here for Rajesh's presentation, you heard about um, sort of edge and you know, it's a thing that we're looking at in OPNFB as well. Um, we've been calling it the virtual central office. And um, you know, I think we've heard a lot about the value proposition, but basically there's all this real estate out there that right now is old, definitely that old style proprietary hardware. Looking at 5G, we want to be able to put things out a lot closer to the subscriber. We want much because of latency. We want to utilize that capacity out there. We don't want it to go to waste. And so we've been looking at, you know, also looking at how do we utilize those central offices. So. At our Beijing summit uh, in June, uh, we actually worked together with a couple communities and a number of different vendors to pull together a, a VCO demo. So we actually used uh, Open Daylight as the uh, common controller. We used OpenStack as our cloud uh, platform. And then we wanted to uh, consolidate control plane functions to, in the, to distribute the data plane into the network fabric. So, um, the cool thing is that we had 28 volunteers for 10 companies that we were like, let's try a community demo for the first time because we've never actually done a community demo at one of our um, big events. And so we had this kind of crazy idea. We settled on wanting to do a virtualized central office. And uh, we had, I want to say, about a month to do this. So um, we, got, we got all these companies coming together, um, and uh, they were able to build this together in a month. Um, and we actually, um, you know, and we ended up having live connectivity and live uh, VCO functionality between um, servers in Beijing, where our summit was, and back in Raleigh, North Carolina, where some of the development work had been going on. Um, 
And then we are currently looking at a version 2.0 of the demo to focus a little bit more on mobile services. This was a fairly enterprise and, and residential focused demo. But here, here's the actual um, architecture stack for it. So um, as we mentioned, it was we had some bare metal switches, and then we had um, uh, OCP um, servers from a, from a couple of different vendors who support OCP. Um, so that was kind of cool because this was one of our first times that we actually had really sort of shown demoing of our software stacks on OCP. For the uh, NFBI, um, we had a KVM with a DPDK. So we did have DPD, DPDK accelerated um, uh, throughput. Um, Ceph for our storage. And then um, we had, uh, I want to say Mellanox provided, set, provided switches uh, for us. Um, and then on the infrastructure side, we basically, it was open daylight, open stack, and then we used Hacker as our VNF manager. And then we were able to deploy a combination of um, VNFs from multiple vendors, as well as some open source VNFs. And then actually showed that they were able to work. So the, the really cool moment that was a little frightening was we actually set up sort of VPN across the two, across a bunch of different vendors out there between Beijing and Raleigh, where you know, the Chinese government's not always happy with VPN. So they were actually often killing our VPN connectivity and we designed a demo around VPN connectivity. Um, and also we were having just network instability between the two, but we actually got, it got up, it was live. We were able to demonstrate a local breakout and, and web traffic being directed different ways. So um, it, was, it was pretty cool. Um, and it also just points to the power of community. I mean, these are volunteers. So these were like 28 people from 10 companies who raised their hand and said, we think this would be cool. We think it's important for our community to be able to, de to demonstrate that all these pieces work together um, as a project. So the last thing that I will leave you with is, you know, OPNFV as a systems integration project does not work in isolation. Um, we work by bringing the industry together to make sure use cases are realized and that the platform really delivers what it's meant to deliver by working in concert with lots of open people, uh, sorry, open organizations. Um, it is a very highly collaborative community. It is a very collaborative um, way of looking uh, at the world. We, we love our upstream partners. Um, we love what they bring to us. We love how we are able to help them make their software better by making sure it works in concert with others. And um, you know, it, is, it has been an extraordinary journey. And I never thought I, as I said earlier, I, I, I left telecom fairly forcefully a little while ago. I never thought I'd be excited about networking again. But the, the networking transformation um, from a technical point of view, as well as what we're doing collaboratively across the open source communities uh, is just extraordinary and excited and, and makes me get out of bed every day. So that's the end. Any questions? Kind of just threw a lot of information at you. And I talk fast, I know. Yeah, so I mean, in case you're curious, things we're looking at uh, moving forward. Um, we're looking at some compliance and verification testing um, towards the end of the year. Um, we're looking to kind of continue to increase this engagement with the uh, cloud native folks on Kubernetes and, and containers. Um, we are, um, I've just mentioned the stuff around, you know, kind of the next rev of the virtualized central office. Um, one of the other things that I, I'd like to see is, you know, we've now launched a large set of test tools and performance testing tools and benchmarking tools. Um, I don't want to get us into the business of, you know, being a benchmarking, you know, sort of lab, but I'd love to start, you know, publishing things that we've learned, you know, by beginning to test different versions of the platform. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you know, our focus so far has actually been in creating kind of a set of a kind of modular test harnesses um, and trying to make sure that they 
good that they kind of work well together. And we've got a couple different projects. So we've got one that focuses on storage, um, a store perf. We've got one that focuses on the virtual switch, that's the F perf. We've got uh, NFB Bench, which is looking at data plane throughput and performance end to end. We've got um, Q-tip, which is benchmarking as a service. Um, so they all have kind of different flavors of like, you know, whether they're looking end to end across the infrastructure, whether they're looking at one particular subcomponent and how you can tune that subcomponent and how it performs under different loads. So you can kind of think of them as sort of a, a suite of tools that kind of depending on what you're needing, you know, they, they all work sort of together kind of with different focus areas depending on, on what's important. Um, that's a good question. We haven't really done much with the data yet. <laughs> and also our focus to date has been on the creation of the tools, not so much in collecting comprehensive data across platforms. Um, so that I think that's something that we might want to start doing or um, at least enabling um, vendors and service providers help them a little bit more how to do that in-house if they want to, for example, test all their vendors, you know, how they might use this in-house or how we might, you know, what we could do as an open source community to, to help them or accelerate them a little further. And we actually have a, a project that did not make it into the Euphrates release, but speaking of data, um, it is, so I mentioned Panda. Um, I think briefly, which is the, the analytics platform. Um, you know, it's you know, built on kind of the standard, you know, Kafka, Spark, et cetera, with a bunch of, you know, ingestion feeds that come in. And then they've actually built a couple of telecom specific apps on top of the, the data uh, storage. Um, they actually have a project within OPNFU called Bamboo, Panda, Bamboo, haha. Um, that did not make it into the Euphrates release, but it is actually using their analytics framework to analyze um, basically all the history of our test database from the beginning of OPNFE. So um, they didn't. They didn't get. They, they they sort of got kind of the setup done in time for Euphrates, but they haven't started any of the analysis. Ah, don't do that. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I think we can probably consider the session done. If you have any you know, questions that you don't want to throw out in the audience, feel free to come up and talk to me personally. And thanks for hanging on through the last session um, of the breakouts today. May you have a good tea break and a good wine reception later tonight.